everyone. Welcome to Paper Conservation at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, uh, 1988 through 2017, and the Smithsonian's broader commitment for preserving cultural heritage with Rosemary Fallon, who is one of SSTCI's board, uh, board members. We're so happy to have you presenting tonight, Rosemary, Thank and you. happy to see so many folks joining us for this special program, uh, which we've been trying to do for quite a while. And we have actually a whole paper theme this month, if anybody has noticed. Last week, we, we had Elsie present on, on um, wallpaper, the history of wallpaper. What? Yeah, it was a fascinating <laughs> program. And then on Monday is our art salon, our quarterly art salon hosted by another board member, Lauren Lay. And that program is called Putting It on Paper, Sketching, Doodling, Making Notes, and Capturing Ideas at the Start of the Creative Process. We have a, um, I think we're, July wins for the longest titles of programs. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our art salon is on, on Monday, July 19th at 8 p.m., 8 to 9.30 p.m., and it's virtually. And then um, Tuesday, we, will, we were going to resume this Tuesday with Twilight Tuesdays, but we are bringing back Twilight Tuesdays on, the, on Veterans Plaza, and they will be from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. So we have steel drum music with Positive Vibrations is coming Tuesday. Um, so I hope you can join us on Veterans Plaza for that. Otherwise, uh, our July events are still virtual. On Thursday, the 22nd at 7.30, we have a tiny house tour, um, exploring the magic and mystery created with paper mache mixed media memories and imagination. And that is with artist Marcy Wolf Hubbard hosting an array of tiny house makers and I I became one myself during uh, the dead of winter when we hosted a tiny house workshop it's come and find out what the mystery is about tiny houses and why people are so excited about them it's there's a lot of stories and interesting things behind these creations and then our featured artist of the month is Christina King, the art of paper making in the studio with artist Christina King. So that will be Monday, July 26th at 8 p.m. Um, I hope you can join us for that. It should be very interesting. She's a wonderful paper artist. And then finally, on Wednesday, July 28th, we have Exploring Origami with Thuru for Solidarity. And this is a workshop led by, um, led by three members of Thuru for Solidarity, Jun Hamamoto, Mari Matsumoto, and Jerry Honda. <clears throat> and uh, Thuru for Solidarity is um, is a nonprofit that is um, it's a nonviolent direct action project of Japanese American social justice advocates and allies working to end detention sites and support directly impacted immigrant and refugee communities that are being targeted by racist inhumane immigration policies. Um, and they stand on the moral authority of Japanese Americans who suffered the atrocities and legacy of US concentration camps during World War II. And they say, stop repeating history. Never again is now. Their mission is to educate, advocate, and prote protest to close all US concentration camps, build solidarity, coordinate intergenerational cross community healing circles and more. So they, Zuru for Solidarity is hosting our origami workshop Wednesday the 28th. That's free, uh, like all of our programs. Um, and all of our events are made possible with generous support from Montgomery County, United Therapeutics, the Arts and Humanities of Montgomery County, Maryland State Arts, and many others. 
And just a reminder, we are recording this session. So it may be available later. <laughs> um, and now let's get to the program, paper on paper conservation. Let me tell you about Rosemary. Rosemary Fallon was paper conservator at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery for nearly 30 years from 1988 through 2017. She received her MS and certificate in conservation from the Columbia University Library and Archives a conservation program. While at the Smithsonian, she engaged in research and activities related to the preservation of cultural heritage, emergency prep, preparedness, salvage and recovery from natural and man-made disasters. So what a fascinating career you've had, Rosemary. We are looking forward to hearing more about you, about your work with the Smithsonian and, and the Smithsonian's broader commitment for preserving cultural heritage. So please take it away, Rosemary. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. Yes, I may have a wordy title. I could have made it longer, but uh, <laughs> maybe it was long enough. <laughs> um, I am gonna talk about what I did at the Portrait Gallery for my career there. And um, also just give a little overview of what uh, conservation of cultural heritage is and how one becomes a conservator. And uh, then a little more about uh, the Smithsonian's um, broader commitment, not just within the US, but also um, internationally for the preservation of cultural heritage uh, as it specifically abroad as it relates to um, preventive conservation and mitigating um, damage from natural disasters and, and armed conflict. So as you see the image here, the National Portrait Gallery, uh, also uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So there's two museums in one. Um, you may have been there, um, hopefully you have. It's located at the Gallery Place Metro, easy to get there, between 7th and 9th Streets and um, F and G. So it takes up two city blocks. It was designed by the architect Robert Mills in the Greek Revival style. And it, the construction was begun in 1836 and it took 31 years to complete. It was home to the Patent Office building, and uh, then it was a, um, a hospital during the Civil War. Um, President Lincoln had his second inaugural ball there. Uh, and it's uh, said that Walt Whitman worked in the building when it was the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And um, so it has a lot of history. It, there was a major renovation, um, which began uh, around the year 2000, and the building reopened in 2006. And what um, was formerly an interior courtyard with trees and plants that was open to the elements, um, after the renovation, it, the courtyard was enclosed with a canopy that was designed by uh, uh, the British architect, oh gosh, now all of a sudden I'm blanking on his name, um, who also designed the canopy at the British Museum. They're similar in appearance, uh, but slightly different in shape, this glass and steel structure. Sir Norman Foster, that's his name, <laughs> the architect. So what is art conservation? This is actually a slide of one of my former American art colleagues, um, Ann Krager, paintings conservator. It's like she's examining a Jean Davis painting. Uh, Jean Davis was a Washington artist and the Smithsonian American Art Museum has um, quite a collection of Jean Davis works. So conservation of cultural heritage as described by the American Institute for Conservation uh, 
and that the American Institute for Conservation and Cultural Heritage is the uh, professional organization for conservators. Um, it's it's uh, defined as uh, the profession devoted to preservation of cultural heritage for the future. The term cultural heritage describes a wide variety of material culture, including objects, um, collections, like whole collections, specimens, structures, architectural um, buildings, um, sites, archaeological sites. Any of these uh, objects and sites as identified as having artistic, historic, scientific, religious, or social significance. So how does one become a conservator? What kind of training do they have? Well, most conservators um, nowadays have master's degrees in conservation. Um, in the old days, uh, conservators were uh, um, were trained, you know, by mentors. Uh, but now it's a, an accredited university program and has been for quite some time. There's a handful of programs in uh, the U.S., some with slightly different um, sort of specialties. Uh, there's one at NYU, which is uh, at the Institute of Fine Arts and Art Conservation. Um, there's one at the Buffalo State uh, College in New York, um, and there are a few others. And if you're really interested in the programs and all the requirements, um, prerequisites, uh, you can go to the American Institute for Conservations for Cultural Heritage website, which is here listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, most of the programs do have quite a few prerequisites in chemistry. Uh, general and organic chemistry are usually required, art history, studio art, and the prerequisites um, may vary according to each program. They generally two years of coursework and a third year of an internship. Sometimes a master, master's degree is required in an allied field. What do conservators do? Well, they do. A lot of different things. Um, actually, I think the, one of the most important things is preventive care and just pre the overall preservation of collections. Um, having a stable environment, using um, chemically stable storage materials, and uh, you know, pr protecting artworks and keeping them stable. Um, but as works are required, uh, acquired by museums or uh, they come up for exhibition, um, conservator examines them and assesses their condition, um, does extensive written and photographic documentation um, of the object, uh, sort of spelling out the treatment, works with the curator, and in, in my case, um, all of the treatment discussions uh, were um, discussed, were you know talked over with the curator. Um, we always examine things together initially, and then I would do the extensive documentation. Um, sometimes research is required on the object, on the artist's uh, techniques, um, or sometimes research for. Uh, conservation techniques uh, and materials to use. So there can be a, a research component depending on the individual object. Um, another uh, thing that professional conservators who are members of the American Institute for Conservation um, have is a code of ethics and the standards of practice, which includes these, um, this extensive documentation to record everything that you're going to do to the object, spell out how you're going to do it, what you're going to use. And after you do these things, you also go step by step. And this is what I did, this is what I used. So someone can come along in the future and know exactly what you did. Um, and there's also this, this theory of reversibility, whereas anything you do to the object can be undone. You know, um, think about, uh, a painting that has yellowed varnish and someone cleans that varnish, um, 
very carefully not to remove any paint and then revarnishes the painting. And then somewhere down the line, maybe a hundred years from now, who knows that painting may need to be, the varnish may need to be cleaned and, and revarnished. So all of that is spelled out in reports so that everything is identified. And so the future conservators know how to care for it. And education, education, not only uh, continuing education of the conservator uh, in workshops and attending conferences, but also education of the staff, you know, at the museum or institution um, where a conservator works, uh, and education to the general uh, public um, about conservation. So what is preventive conservation? Uh, as far as paper goes, the light is very damaging to paper. Um, so minimizing the effects of light, uh, obvious when it's on view, and also, uh, of course, when it's in storage. Providing a stable, moderate relative humidity and temperature is really important. Pest management programs always have emergency, um, you know, your emergency plan updated, um, have supplies ready in case there is an emergency, know how to store your objects using the appropriate um, uh, cabinets and uh, materials, mat, mat boards, boxes, know how to handle them very carefully, <laughs> advise other people how to handle them, um, and knowing how to display the objects properly. So light, light is like like I said, the damage is uh, is can it can be um, uh, it's not it's not reversible. It's cumulative. So the more light exposure something has, the more damage can be done. Um, as you've probably seen, fading of watercolors, fading of pigments and dyes. You've probably seen um, colored papers bleached and lightened or yellowing just of, uh, of papers. And uh, it's the kind of thing that we like to minimize in conservation so that, you know, all these museum goers in the future can enjoy the object too. So you kind of can try to control the exposure and the degradation. So this is a, a recording hyperthermograph, this little slide of this object actually records the temperature and relative humidity. And it, the humidity is actually measured by using uh, hair because hair is very hygroscopic as we all know. When it's humid, your hair kind of gets all bushy. And when it's dry, it sort of lays flat. Um, and the reason we, control humidity and temperature because too much humidity can cause mold growth. Um, too dry environment can cause the, the, you know, some inks and, and paints to crack. Um, the binders become desiccated uh, and it causes paper to expand in uh, humid environments, contract in dry environments that can cause cockling and um, uh, you know, sometimes even tears in paper. Disasters, everyone's worst nightmare. Just like at home, you could have a flood in your basement or a burst pipe. Um, yeah, actually, I would say the most prevalent type of disaster is a water-related one for most uh, institutions. Um, just a burst pipe in, in a building, a leaky pipe, especially in an older building, um, can cause a lot of trouble. And as you all know, uh, water can you know, cause mold to grow, um, bleed inks and other media. Earthquakes, of course, are uh, quite devastating with physical damage and 
all kinds of, uh, you know, surface dirt rubble. Um, and fire, of course, can be uh, devastating as well. So um, being aware of, of, you know, the risks and trying to plan um, so that you can mitigate effects of those uh, possible disasters is something that um, museums do and conservators are, are involved in. And every institution should have a disaster plan. Sometimes you know, even homeowners, you know, families maybe need a disaster plan, something happens. You have, you know, all the important institutional information. Um, everyone, you know, who's involved in, in a response and recovery in the institution needs to know what their, you know, what their role is, that the plan should be very detailed. Uh, everyone should have a copy that, that, that's involved in the response and recovery, you need to have supplies on hand. And training is really important, training of the staff um, so that uh, they can respond quickly and, um, and then mitigate the damage. So here is the uh, Lunder Conservation Center Paper Conservation Lab at the National Portrait Gallery and Smithsonian American Art Museum. And after the renovation, when the building reopened in 2006, this, the new conservation labs were built with these um, glass, floor to ceiling glass windows so that members of the public could walk down the hallway and see what um, conservators do and what they're working on. And also there's you know, informational text and panels in the hallway and, and videos. Um, and sometimes there would be featured events so that, you know, something video screen put up to the window facing to the, the public could see and well, someone was maybe consolidating paint under a microscope so they could actually see more closely what was going on. So this is the, the lab where I worked. Um, really lovely space with lots of great uh, uh, equipment. And what do, what do paper conservators do exactly? Well, like I said before, what conservators in general do, we examine and document and treat um, uh, as far as paper goes, a variety of works on paper for acquisition, exhibition, collection storage, includes prints, drawings, watercolors, any, any media on paper, um, photographic materials, uh, typical treatments and includes surface cleaning, removing harmful attachments such as press, press, pressure sensitive tape and poor quality matting materials, reducing discoloration and staining and flattening paper distortions and um, mounting uh, artworks for exhibition. So what is paper exactly? It was invented in China around 100 AD. It made its way through North Africa to Spain, uh, into the rest of Europe, uh, made its way into Spain about the 11th century and then into the rest of Europe. It replaced parchment and papyrus as the most prevalent writing support. Parchment is animal skin and papyrus is, uh, it's not paper in the true sense, um, it's, uh, layers of a reed-like plant that is adhered with the gum of the plant and then can be extended um, to make a long scroll. But it's not a beaten pulp and, and then um, in a slurry of water that is then formed into a sheet. As you can see what's happening in this slide. There's a vat here of, of a beaten fiber and a slurry of water and he's got a Thing that looks sort of like a screen, it's a mold that then the water uh, sifts through and you're left with these matted fibers. And the paper is then tossed onto felts and left, left to dry. And uh, it's the um, sort of water, hygroscopic uh, water 
bonding that keeps the fibers together. And as we know, paper is very vulnerable and subject to damage very easily with tears and punctures. Um, originally, it was made from cotton or linen rags that were beaten to a pulp or plant material. And as I described, drawn through this mold. So examination. Here's the photographs conservator for the portrait gallery examining a photograph under magnifications. Um, many times you need to use a binocular microscope so you can see more closely, you know, maybe to identify a photographic process or a printing technique uh, or examine closely for surface anomalies or cracking or losses. And that's the first step in, in treating the work, of course, is the examination. So all the images I'm going to show you are from the Portrait Gallery's collection. Just thought I'd mention that. Um, and uh, to be in the Portrait Gallery, you have to be an American. I know there's actually on the right, there's a wood engraving of Christopher Columbus, who is not an American, but I'll explain that later. Um, this is America saw itself portrait watercolor on the left from about 1880. Um, the artist does not have to be an American. Uh, the, the person in the portrait is usually called the sitter, referred to as the sitter. The sitter needs to have contributed in some significant way to American culture, uh, you know, history. Um, and not necessarily always in a, you know, uh, you just say a positive manner or a good manner. And Al Capone is in the collection, Jesse James. I mean, there are criminals in the portrait color collection um, because they're historic figures. Uh, and there's a, um, you know, and a committee um, of portrait gallery who, curators and historians who decide on the, the uh, whether someone is, has the right significance for the Portrait Gallery and then also a board of commissioners. Um, so, you know, the decision is not made lightly. So yeah, art on paper includes all of these type of media, charcoal, Conte crayon, graphite pencil, pastel, watercolor, or like I said, any um, ink on paper or uh, other, you know, paint, acrylic paint and oil paint on prints, the relief prints, like, like a wood engraving or a wood block, intaglio, like an etching, and planographic um, lithograph, silk screen. Here is a graphite pencil drawing of Ornette Coleman, the jazz uh, artist, by Elaine de Kooning. Um, this happens to be a well-known American and also by a well-known artist, which is, you know, always a good thing. Charcoal. Uh, and Hello, is everyone still there? Oh. Um, I hear you. Oh, okay. Lisa? 
Yes, sorry, oh. I was muted. I was saying That's you had what happened. I oh, briefly sorry. froze and muted. Yeah, okay. you're back. All okay. right. Um, so yeah, this technology is great when it works, right? Um, <laughs> this is Elaine de Kooning, uh, charcoal Don't drawing. Need. I, I was talking, I was saying how charcoal is a, um, really uh, one of the oldest drawing materials used in cave paintings throughout the centuries. Um, usually, you know, if you're in a, your first drawing class, you're using vine charcoal and a chamois cloth and you're, you know, adjust, re wiping it off and readjusting your drawing. Um, and, uh, you know, it comes in the, the sort of vine, just the charcoal sticks. Um, also in pencils, you know, with a binder. Um, but it's it's a great a, a great drawing um, medium. Here's uh, the boxer Joe Lewis. This is a Conte Cran drawing. Um, Conte Cran was invented by Nicholas Conte. That's our little nod to France today for Bastille Day. <laughs> um, and it originally was made from powdered graphite and clay, and and it, you know usually has now comes in you know different colors, white and, and sort of red, um, and probably uses uh, various different types of binders. And this is a um, pastel drawing. Uh, it's actually of the American artist Beaufort Delaney, and it's by Georgia O'Keeffe. It's uh, from 1943. And Georgia O'Keeffe did not do many portrait drawings, but she did this one. And it's actually quite a beautiful uh, pastel drawing. And pastel uh, is made from finely ground pigments with a small amount of binder. Uh, which traditionally was got from gum tracanth. Um, nowadays they make you know oil pastels and pastels with different um, waxes and, and resins in them. Um, but traditional class, uh, pastels uh, that have very little binder, as you know, it can be very powdery and flaky. And so um, that is a, a hazard to using the um, uh, the medium, but it's it's a beautiful medium, really lovely, makes dense, velvety, you know, drawings. Now I'll talk a little bit about the treatment, um, the treatment that I did at the portrait gallery. Here, here's a, a picture of me actually just using a very soft brush just to, to gently clean the surface of this photograph. And actually that photograph, it's a color photograph of uh, Roy Rogers. It's one of the very early color processes called uh, three color carbro. Oh, and here we are, there's Joe Lewis again. Um, the image on the left is before the treatment and you can see um, here in the, the upper right and the left is sort of darkened areas as adhesive on the back, like a rubber cement is called adhesive. This is actually a, a tracing paper, kind of a thin, kind of brittle tra tracing paper. And you can see these attachments, these hinges up here, and uh, there's a little small little tears along the edges. Uh, so I um, removed that adhesive, so you can see just a little slight shadow from the, the little light staining on the back, but um, was able to successfully remove that and remove the little attachments, um, the unstable attachments and repair the tears. And this is um, that wood engraving of Christopher Columbus. This is from uh, 1584. And the reason uh, we have this in our collection is, is that you know, he's somewhat of a controversial figure these days. Uh, however, his, uh, you know, navigational skills uh, are um, notable and, or, you know, were notable. And because of, you know, his expert 
navigational skills, um, he opened the world up to the Americas. Um, this uh, on the left is before it was treated. This was actually washed. It's a technique that paper conservators can use in some treatment. Some treatments. It depends on a lot of things like the media and the, the condition and um, uh, you know, there's just a, several factors of whether you can do a treatment like that. Um, because as you know, uh, or you may not know, um, that paper, some papers can get very acidic, uh, especially poor quality papers. And sometimes it's um, the, you know, what they're made of, their inherent vice, as, as we call it, um, and also environmental um, and its history and exposure to, to whatever has occurred in its lifetime. Um, here you can see the stain at the bottom, and uh, the stain was lightened after washing, and there were, there were tears and creases, and I think there was a loss up in this corner here uh, on the left and then that was repaired and the stain was lightened. And, you know, with some sort of uh, treatments, you're not, you're not trying to make something look perfect. You're not trying to make it look like it's new. Uh, you're sort of respecting the history of it, but you're also stabilizing it. And um, if you're washing it, you're, the water solution that you're using, um, and in, in many cases in, in paper conservation treatments, it's an alkaline water solution. And you're sort of releasing some of those degradation components from the paper. So the paper is actually more stable after the treatment than it was before. Oh, here's a drawing of Frank Sinatra by uh, Edward Sorrell from 1966. Um, and you can see the sort of discolored adhesive along the edges. So um, I was removing that with uh, a tested solvent um, that solubilized that adhesive. And this is an interesting piece. It is um, an advertisement for an escaped slate. <clears throat> from a Boston newspaper in 1807. It's uh, the woodcut, profile woodcut of the slave is here. His name was Sancho. Um, as you can see, this is discolored and there's creases and these sort of dark stains um, and there's tears along the edges. And uh, it was treated in a similar type of alkaline water bath as the other. Um, piece and uh, the stains were lightened, but it still has, you know, it has still has a look of some history, which is a good thing. Um, and this, uh, the, the advertisement is very interesting. I, I'll read you some of what it says. Um, it says, Sancho, uh, as he was called, is about five feet high very black complexion, good teeth, not corpulent, but well-formed, and a fast walker. It also notes that he had been, trained, had been trained as a barber. With particular irony, the advertisement states that if Sancho voluntarily returns to the service of his master, he shall be received with kindness, while anyone found to be harboring him will be punished. Sancho, um, was said to have lived on the plantation of Winthrop Sargent, who was the um, governor of the Mississippi Territory. And the plantation was near Natchez, Mississippi. But, uh, you know, he said, oh, it appeared in a Boston newspaper. That's because they had slave catchers in various Northern states because if the states, slaves escaped to the North, these slave catchers, would still try to find them and take them back to the slave owner. And actually the portrait gallery had a number of um, these slave narratives, some in actually <clears throat> in book form with wood graving illustrations of the slaves escape 
Um, some of them were published in England after the slave was free, freed, and uh, they're very interesting. Um, I, um, I was lucky to be able to, to read a lot of them while I was working there. And uh, this is the photographs conservator uh, treating a uh, photograph of Robert Mitchum, the actor. Um, she using a watercolor to touch in some loss in the corner. But before she, she isolates the uh, surface of the, of the uh, paper where the loss is with a certain type of um, solution and then uses the watercolor on top of that so that that watercolor can be uh, easily removed from that surface in the future if it needs to be. Exhibition mounting is a large part of uh, what uh, is done, especially in a museum like the Portrait Gallery, um, where there are lots of exhibitions, and also what they call permanent collection galleries, where items rotate in and out just to tell the story of, um, of uh, you know, Americans um, from, from the beginning. So this is the um, exhibition specialist. He is using a Japanese paper with a special cooked wheat starch paste, which is a very stable adhesive um, to attach the, the Japanese paper or hinges is attached into the back of the drawing. Here is, this is the mounting board. He will mount the drawing on so that it's stable to be put into a frame. Here is the uh, drawing. It's a, excuse me, portrait of John, the artist, uh, California artist, John Baldessari. This was done by the, uh, by the, an artist named Alphonse van uh, Rookham. It's from 2009. It's a charcoal, Conte crayon, and pastel uh, drawing on paper. As you can see, it's quite large. <laughs> And here it is on exhibition in the gallery. And here I am speaking with our uh, exhibition um, uh, mounting specialist. And uh, also uh, he uh, mats and houses things for storage. And here we are discussing how uh, to mount and mat these um, objects here. Here uh, is a glass plate negative. It's a full size collodion glass plate negative uh, of Alexander Gardner from the 19th century. It's um, by Alexander Gardner, excuse me, of Abraham Lincoln. It's being uh, housed for exhibition. Um, and uh, of course, to be very careful handling a large plate of 19th century glass. Um, so this is what they're doing, talking about the construction of the housing and how it will be exhibited. Oh, and um, another type of uh, art medium is digital video. Um, here in the lab is um, an intern. She's originally from Croatia and came to DC as an, uh, to work as a nanny, but then put herself through University of the District of Columbia majoring in photography. When she was a senior, she came to our lab and uh, worked with us and the um, Smithsonian, uh, you know, other museums and uh, the IT people who are responsible for uh, preserving digital video art, call it time-based media art. So uh, it all had to be, all the digital video had to be formatted in um, a certain way, we called it the archival package, and then uploaded to the data asset management system for storage. And um, you know, as the technology changes, all of the, the uh, uh, data gets migrated 
um, to new, newer technologies so it's preserved for the future and accessible. Unfortunately, Anna had to leave the country because she couldn't get a, uh, a green card and um, a, a visa, extend her visa and went to um, England. And we train uh, interns from graduate um, programs. So we have summer internships um, and uh, their third year, I mentioned that the coursework and most of the, the master's degree programs require a third year internship. And we have uh, interns that we mentor from those programs for their third year as well. And fellows and postgraduates from the uh, programs who uh, many times we uh, host to work on special projects under the mentorship of a um, staff conservator. And uh, undergrads are taken, as I mentioned, Anna. Well, Anna wasn't interested in conservation necessarily as a profession, but she was um, very familiar with digital photography. So it worked well um, for that project that she worked on. Um, but there are undergrads who, are, who think that they're interested in a career in conservation. And um, sometimes they come uh, for an internship in the summer. Uh, or maybe they're, you know, if they're depending on the way their university or college is structured, they come maybe in the January short, you know, uh, one month program, just to get an idea of uh, what the uh, is required, and you know, to be a conservator, and and if they if they actually like doing it and want to do all the prerequisites that are necessary and commit that time for a career in conservation. Another interesting um, part of the National Portrait Gallery Collection is the, the time collection, original cover art. I have about 2,000 pieces from the uh, Time Magazine collection. Um, most of them, all of them really were done for reproduction for the cover of Time Magazine, but they are original artworks. This is Marilyn Monroe here and Harry Truman. And um, Time did commission some well-known uh, artists of the time, of the time, um, to uh, do covers for them. And this one, you may recognize the style of Roy Lichtenstein, um, that pop art style of Robert Kennedy. Uh, and, you know, um, this cover ran in May of 1968 and Robert Kennedy was assassinated a few weeks after this. Uh, which is kind of uh, sad. And at the same time uh, that Roy Lichtenstein was commissioned to do this cover, he was commissioned to do a second cover run after this uh, a month or two later of the smoking gun. You might remember that image. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide of that, but it's the smoking gun done in the same uh, pop art style. And that, that was particular irony that he was commissioned to do this one and to do that one, the, the smoking gun. Those are the only two that he did. Um, and then Kennedy was, was assassinated in between those covers. Um, but Roy Lichtenstein had um, you know, a real hand in the design of this. It was done to exactly to his specifications. And this, this is a, a hard slide to read, and I realize that, but I just want to give you an idea of the process where he did all these preparatory black and white drawings to uh, you know for each color um, plate that was to be used in the printing of the cover. Um, spelled it out as to exactly what color. He had his own sort of standard colors that he used. Uh, and he spelled out exactly what color it should be and how the design should be. Um, and they created these uh, acetate uh, film for each color plate so the overlay they could see exactly what it's going to look like before they actually made the printing plates. Um, so it was quite. Um, <clears throat> He was quite involved in the process of the whole way, which was unusual. I, I spoke to one of the, the 
printers. He was there during this time. And he said it was highly unusual for someone to be that involved um, in the production of the, of the cover. But some of the, you know, Robert Rauschenberg did covers, also another famous uh, artist, abstract, abstract expressionist, Robert Rauschenberg. Andy Warhol did covers too. Oh, and, and Robert Kennedy said, when he saw the cover, he said, oh, I think your cover just looks marvelous, but I don't have red spots all over my face. Um, another aspect of um, conservators' uh, job is to accompany artworks during travel. Not at all travel, but travel overseas, especially. And sometimes it also depends on the artwork itself. Um, you know, what its value, its importance, its um, vulnerability. Um, this is a, a drawing of, um, this is a self-portrait of William Beckman, uh, American artist. And um, I don't believe she is, I think she's a friend. Uh, her name is Jeannie, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> very large drawing, charcoal drawing. <clears throat> This was just taken to a, a, another museum in the United States, but um, most of those uh, courier trips by conservators um, are done overseas uh, you know, because it's a, kind of a complex system of accompanying the artwork to the cargo uh, warehouse where it's um, you know, uh, prepared for either the cargo in a passenger plane, depending on the size of it, or the cargo in a cargo plane, if it's a very large piece. Um, and I usually, I, I went on passenger planes with the cargo and the cargo hold of the plane. However, um, I did go on a cargo plane. That was quite an experience. I was the only passenger. It was me and the crew with tons of cargo, all sorts of cargo, cars and <laughs> name it. To, went to Germany. But um, so because it's all process of getting it uh, housed in the cargo warehouse or working with a customs broker, um, you used to be able to go out on the tarmac and actually watch it be loaded. But after 9 11, you couldn't do that anymore. The customs broker does that. And so you're in conversation and consultation with the customs broker the whole time you're at the airport. And then you accompany it to the destination. You meet the customs broker in the country where you arrive. Um, and you go through that process of going to their cargo warehouse, getting it all through customs on the other end, and then uh, on to the uh, destination, the museum, wherever it's going. So all of that is like one continual activity with no breaks in between. After it's all done, you can go back and take a nap in your hotel. And then you go back for installation after it's acclimated for at least 24 hours in the, in the museum where it will be shown. You go back and for the unpacking and installation of the piece and oversee it. Um, because some, you, you never know what to expect in some museums exactly, you know, uh, sometimes they just wanna do what they wanna do, not what you want them to do. <laughs> Oh, and so this is what I was talking about, sort of the broader outreach of the Smithsonian um, about preventive conservation and um, preparing for disasters and disaster mitigation. Um, after, what I will talk about the Haiti Cultural Recover Recovery Project in a minute, but after that project, um, uh, we started to uh, do presentations for um, army soldiers who would be going overseas and, and one of their um, you know, assignments would be to actually protect the cultural property of a country like Iraq or Syria. Um, and so they needed some kind of training. Um, so they understood exactly what it is that you know, they were responsible for. Um, so we did that for Marines and for uh, army soldiers. Um, and also the Smithsonian has affiliates all over the US, uh, smaller museums that don't have, let's say the, the breadth of staff and expertise that the Smithsonian has. And so um, 
the Smithsonian does programs for the affiliates and also the affiliates uh, borrow um, objects from the Smithsonian. And then uh, the Smithsonian partners with other organizations to do training. ICROM is um, an international uh, conservation organization in Rome. And that stands for International Center for the Study and Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. Uh, and uh, I participated in a training program um, of the Smithsonian partner with ICROM for international um, you know, people from all over the world. And they hold these, they do this in, in various parts of the world, ICROM does this training. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about this um, cultural recovery project that uh, um, evolved after the 2010 um, terrible earthquake in Haiti. And unfortunately, we're hearing a lot about Haiti nowadays. Um, it's so sad because uh, people there are just so um, wonderful and just want a life, a good life for themselves and their families. Um, so Richard Curran, who at the time of the earthquake was the undersecretary for history, art, and culture at the Smithsonian. He had also been the former director of the Folk Life Center at the Smithsonian. Um, he had some personal connections with uh, uh, Haiti because uh, when he was uh, Folk Life um, director, uh, he, uh, they featured Haiti in 2004. So he got to know a lot of um, you know, yeah, these connections. And so when the earthquake happened and uh, a lot of the, you know, there's so much damage, not, you know, obviously, you know, um, people were killed and homeless, um, but also a lot of the, uh, the museums and National Library well, were uh, damaged and, you know, a lot of things were destroyed and, um, Haiti doesn't have a national museum of artwork. It, it's really held in private uh, museums. But art in, ha in Haiti is just something that is just, uh, you know, it's like their national profession. I mean, they're, they're just artists everywhere. And it's very, very meaningful for them. But they don't have a, uh, a system of culture of art conservation. So, um, Richard reached out and, and said, you know, we can help in any way. And it, it ended up working out uh, in such a way that lots of partners, um, uh, Corinne Wagner, who at that time was the uh, US uh, director of the US Committee for Blue Shield, which is for the international uh, actually cultural heritage involved after, um, you know, Second World War with all the Nazi looting of uh, art collections. Um, and uh, she was, uh, had been a US soldier in Iraq. Um, and then when she left the army, she got a master's, or, excuse me, PhD in art history and was a curator at the University of, at the uh, Minneapolis Art Museum when this happened. So, um, Richard reached out to her and uh, got this, you know, got Smithsonian conservators involved. And uh, I and another colleague, uh, Emily Clayman Jacobson, who is the conservator, paper conservator at the Fair Sackler then and, and is now as well, um, to teach a course there. And uh, it was a year after the earthquake. So, um, this was at the center that was um, uh, refurbished. Um, it's a center the, uh, run by the Haitian government and the Smithsonian, um, the Minister of Culture. Um, the former Minister of Culture was a friend of Richard's from the folk life days. And he was uh, the sort of Haitian director of the center. And then there was a, uh, a U.S. conservator who had been at the um, uh, African Art Museum at the Smithsonian, 
uh, who also did her master's degree in art history in Haitian art, and she spoke French. Um, Creole is the, sort of the language in Haiti, but a lot of Haitians speak French. So um, it made the communication easier. So here, we had a translator actually for our uh, course, because some of the students did not speak any English. I'd say most of them did not, some of them did, or understood and didn't speak very well. Um, so here we're teaching them, uh, you know, how to identify print processes and photographic processes. And on the right here, my colleague, Emily Jacobson is demonstrating how to repair a tear. But most of our training was um, about, you know, stable storage, uh, um, you know, trying to get equipment like dehumidifiers and things because you know it's the, the climate in Haiti, it's a tropical climate, and um, to try to minimize any kind of cold activity and um, using quality materials. We, we taught them how to do pH testing for materials that they might buy to house artwork in. Um, and, and the students were uh, a mix of chemists, um, artists, uh, National Library of uh, Haiti uh, employees, and um, uh, actually one student was actually had her own gallery. So on here, on the left, we're um, teaching them how to surface clean an artwork. And on the right, we're doing the pH testing. Of the, actually, we're testing the storage materials to make sure that they weren't acidic. And here's our class. It's our last day of the group. I hope they're all OK. And so as a result of that project, um, the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, um, Corinne Wagner, who had been at the Minneapolis um, Museum of Art and was the director of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield at that time, was recruited to come to the Smithsonian and create this Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. So um, this office um, now does training um, that the, uh, I mentioned the um, training of the international um, you know, students uh, that I participated in. Um, that's something that they're they're doing. They they all go to um, places around the globe. They went to Puerto Rico after the earthquake, and um, Nepal after the earthquake, and uh, um, partnered with Iraq in, uh, and the State Department to create a conservation center in uh, Erbil, Iraq for um, Iraqis to, uh, and train them how to um, conserve, you know, artwork and uh, prevent, you know, mitigate disasters and that sort of thing. The end, thank you for listening. <laughs> That was that was so great, Rosemary. Oh, that was terrific. I enjoyed it. But I I know we had some questions in the comments. Uh -huh. um, I'm gonna have to scroll through to find to find them. Um, did folks have? If you want to stop your screen share, and then we can. Um, Yeah. So who has a question for Rosemary? We have, um, I think Linda, I remember Linda wrote one in the comments. Can you ask that? Because I can't remember exactly what the question was and if you want to. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um... Is there something safe to use at home uh, that dissolves tape? Because in family documents, I find paper has been taped to something and then it's just horrible. <laughs> yeah, um, that is a real uh, dilemma and a conundrum. Um, 
Not really. There isn't really anything I can tell you to use to dissolve the tape. And not all tape is created equally. Um, and the age can have something, you know, cause problems or not. Sometimes when it gets really old, it dries up and falls off. And then you have uh -huh. the adhesive and the staining. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, um, there isn't really anything I can tell you to use um, about how to get it off. If it's fresh tape, you know, sometimes you can very carefully peel it off of something. Um, however, then you run the risk of, you know, damaging the surface if it doesn't work out well. So right. I, I, you know, I know that a lot of people can't afford to, uh, you know, there are private conservators who do this kind of work, can't necessarily afford to, um, to do that, but you can, you can get a uh, list of private conservators in the area. If you go to that website, um, I pointed out at the bottom of that slide, the American Institute for Culture, Conservation of Cultural Heritage. Um, if you Google that, it will come up. Okay, thank they you. Have all, I mean, the site has, you know, just about everything you want to know about conservation on it. And it also has, um, you know, a list of private conservators. And they can give you, you know, like a range of treatment costs, depending on what it is, you know, um, that you need to have done. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and in keeping with that, kind of question about our documents at home. I just recently was home and back home in San Diego and um, I was going through stuff in storage, like old letters, postcards and photographs. And I'm trying to weed through them and decide what to keep. What do you, how do you recommend we store our personal paper items like old letters and papers from college that we want to keep you can um, there are various um companies that sell sort of archival boxes you can go uh online um there's a i'm trying to think off the top of my head uh, for photographic um uh storage light impressions is one um Conservation, I want to say conservation materials is another one. Uh, there might even, there may even be a list of something like that on the website that I described, um, the American Institute for Conservation. But if you if you Google archival storage materials, there'll probably be several companies that that come up. Um, and you know, th there are boxes, and you can interleave, you know, some with like an acid-free paper. And uh, just so that they're in, um, you know, these sort of chemically stable boxes, maybe interleaved with paper or in folders that are chemically stable archival materials. That's like a great step. And don't store it in a basement or an attic, you know, because you want it to have a relatively stable um, temperature and humidity. You don't want it to be in a damp place or a hot, super hot place. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and in the dark, you know, store it in the dark, you know, well, if it's in a box, it's in the dark anyway. So you don't, you don't want on top of the radiator or, you know, sitting by the, the, you know, heating vent, you know, in a closet, you know, on a shelf, it's a good place for it. <laughs> or not, then, not near the AC either. Not near the that AC. can be very damaging. <laughs> um, you know, right. so yeah, there, there are a lot of companies, I've, I've, you know, available to, to sell that sort of thing. So S Sneha asks in the chat to expand on that question. I think it's tied to this too. Would you ask on my behalf regarding the treatment of handmade papers and pigments and novel materials? Oh, I'm sorry, say that again. Um, she wrote to me, I don't know if it's to me or to everyone. Um, would you ask on my behalf regarding the treatment of handmade papers and pigments and novel materials. So maybe you've already talked about the papers. I'm not really uh, sure exactly what she means. I mean, handmade papers runs a huge gamut. I mean, 
you know, um, depends on what the paper is made from, like what kind of material it's made from, what kind of components are, you know, does it have dyes, or is it bleached, does it, you know, there's, it's hard to answer that question, but um, you wouldn't treat something, like physically treat it, unless there's, there was a reason to do so. I mean, if you just want to store those things, if they're handmade or they're handmade pigments, hand ground pigments or however, um, you know, whatever they are, you would store them in the same type of, you know, with in those types of materials that I mentioned, these sort of acid free folders and boxes and, you know, or mats. If you want to mat something, make sure that you're getting good quality, museum quality mat board. I mean, that's, it may be the more expensive thing, but that's, you know, that's what you can do. And then you can put, you know, the mat in a frame, but make sure you, if you've got glass or something on it that you're using, you know, one that has ultraviolet filtering. They make glass with ultraviolet filtering. They make an acrylic, um, you know, it's not glass, it's acrylic, which is actually what the museums use because it's more lightweight and uh, it doesn't break as easily. But it filters out the ultraviolet light, which is the most damage, damaging type of light for um, uh, paper artworks. What, ultraviolet light? Ultraviolet is, yeah, is the most damaging, just like to your skin. And it's damaging <laughs> to humans too. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, so it, it really is worth spending the money on proper storage, archival boxes, and not just, using, so. a, Especially, not just using a shoe box. Yeah, don't use your little cardboard box that you got from, you know, Amazon. You know, use, use a, a better quality box. I just okay. want to say that everything was really interesting and educational and I enjoyed it. Oh, I'm so happy. That's the idea. I'm glad you, I'm glad you found it to be um, enjoyable and educational. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Vivian. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if there's, if, if you have a question, please raise your hand, turn on your screen or raise your, there's a little a reaction and you can raise your hand like that, where it says reactions at the bottom. Um, I wanted to ask how you got into this field, Rosemary. Oh, oops, ah, ah, come back. Did you lose <laughs> us? Um, no, here. I'm not sure what happened there. We can uh, still see How you. I got into the field. Okay. I, um, <clears throat> I knew about the field when I was uh, an undergraduate, but I wasn't all that interested in pursuing it at the time. I was uh, studying uh, art history and studio art. And uh, when I graduated, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Moscow, um, huh? Russia during the Soviet times and uh, it was 1976. And with my, my sister and brother-in-law was their very first post in the State Department. And they had some little girls and I sort of helped take care of them, but I took Russian and I met a lot of uh, what they were called at the time, dissident artists, unofficial artists who created the art they wanted to create and they weren't part of the artist union and creating you know, what um, they had to create, what was required. Um, art as opposed to their own creative art. Um, so there were these little, you know, salons that, because um, uh, they wanted to meet foreigners um, to buy their artwork or even trade things for their artwork and get it out of the country so people could see it. And they'd have these little, you know, exhibitions in someone's uh, apartment. So I got to know a number of these artists and found out that there was a, a, a man in the US who was collecting a lot of this work. I found out from the Russian artists and the uh, Ukrainians and I befriended a number of artists that were from Odessa in Ukraine. And so found out about this collector who happened to 
live in Maryland, down in Southern Maryland on the Patuxent River and taught at the University of Maryland and uh, St. Mary's College in Southern Maryland. So when I got back, I uh, looked him up and um, he offered me a part-time job to help catalog his collection, myself and, and another um, uh, young woman who was uh, a student at Georgetown at the time. And so we would go down to his estate in Southern Maryland where he had his collection spread all over the floor um, so that we could uh, properly catalog it. And from that, um, a catalog was created. We worked on creating the catalog of the work and um, some exhibitions, uh, worked on setting up the exhibitions in Washington, D.C. and uh, a few places down in, in the city. So um, I worked for him for a while. And uh, after that, I was like, you know, I need another job. And so I went to the Smithsonian and I, I uh, worked in um, the Natural History Museum and sort of specialized in the book area and I became an assistant book buyer. So I did that for a number of years, an assistant book buyer for all the museum stores. And from when I was there, I was exposed to art conservation. I went to a couple lectures and thought, you know what? I think this is what I want to do. So I started taking the chemistry, which was a prerequisite. Um, and uh, ended up going to the Columbia program. The Columbia program uh, was in rare books and paper and library and archives conservation. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, they, Columbia during uh, the 1990s downsized a lot of small departments. And so that program um, uh, left Columbia and sort of a semblance of it went to the University of Texas uh, but it wasn't quite the same because we were also affiliated with the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. So we took some classes at NYU um, as well. And uh, yeah, so that, that program is not anymore. They do have um, a Columbia Historic Preservation Program um, that's a little different. I don't think, it's not sort of a conservation hands-on. It's more of a broader um, historic preservation kind of program. Um, Right. So there's a lot of chemistry involved in this. A lot of chemistry. Yeah, you need to have a, a background in it. Yeah. And so what are some, did you, did you, um, did someone ask or did you, because someone asked in the chat, did, are there materials at home, like things that we find around the house that we can use to clean documents <laughs> or should we not even try? Um. I wouldn't advise it only because you might, you know, it's kind of, sometimes you might do more damage than help. I mean, one thing you can do if things are dusty, take a soft, a soft brush, you know, mm -hmm. kind of soft brush you can get in an art store. Uh, and brought, you saw me doing that with that photograph, just a soft brush to, to sort of, you know, if there's any kind of debris on the surface or dust on the surface, just brush brush it carefully, depending on what you're brushing. Obviously, you're not going to brush a charcoal drawing or a pastel. You might just brush the whole thing away. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but for, you know, printed material or something, you know, try something like that. Um, keeping oh. things and you know, they sell those sort of archival plastic sleeves. You know, you can put things in those and put them in, in binders or having them in a box is good because then you don't get the ambient dust landing on them right right oh god i'm just thinking of the tens of thousands of photos i have that i need to do something with yeah you know um, it all do I, I can't say that i'm perfect either <laughs> my own <yeah>. things <laughs> i'm planning to scan them and throw them away but no, don't do and then that. just have electronic you know you think I should keep the physical I do especially the ones from my Peace Corps service I have them all in these I would not throw them away I put them in the, albums I put them in a get you know look up some of those archival binders with the sleeves for the photos yeah I 
you know, you casually just start leafing through them instead of having to look them on the screen. I mean, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a different thing. I, I it is a nicer experience to see the real photo. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can scan and, them too, but I wouldn't get rid of the original. Right, a, right. Like, terrible shape and torn in half or something. Right. I think Vivian, did you raise your hand just now, Vivian? Did you have a question? Yeah, so just a comment. I think you should, uh, Lisa, you should put it in the, make a collage out of the pictures. Well, I have, I have a bunch of photos I took during my two and a half years of Peace Corps service and they're all in order. So there, but I have them glued to pages, paper pages in albums, these very large albums, so there's five. So I don't know, there's probably at least a thousand photos there. Oh, More than that, I think. Pictures. <laughs> right. Was there anyone else who had a question for Rosemary before we close or a comment? Um, I, okay, so Barbara? Oh, no questions, but I enjoyed this. Thank you, Rosemary. Oh, That's my mom. You. Nice to see you, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been terrific, Rosemary. And you are coming back. You are invited to be our featured artist sometime this fall. Can you tell us a little bit about your art form? <laughs> um, well, I mainly do Polaroid. Um, old school Polaroid uh, photography, um, but I, I scan them and print them on Japanese papers. Um, and I also do mono prints. So they're prints, uh, one of a kind prints using a gel plate with acrylic paint. Um, uh, you know, just a plate on paper, press it in. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been doing quite a number of those in the last couple of years. So. Both of those things, and usually my my uh, I don't do people. I don't do uh, people in my um, artwork. It's all sort of natural settings or some, you know, maybe even a sort of semi-abstract kind of thing. But there's there are no people involved. <laughs> no portraits. And, <laughs> right. And. Did you, are you, is your work still on exhibit at the uh, Washington Women's Art oh, League? Oh, well, well, they have periodic exhibitions. Uh, right now, uh, there's nothing, I have nothing in there. I think, do I have something? Oh, I have something. I think, I think it's still, it's online, Montgomery Art Association. That's a mono print. Yeah. Actually, I won an award for that print in the abstract oh. category. Yeah, I think that's still online until the end of July, I think. The okay. Association, Creative Expressions, it's called. Um, right now, I think that's the only thing I'm, I've got. Right, you were in an exhibition in May. May. I was June. in, uh, I was one, in one in April. Uh, okay. And that into May, and that was the oh. Maryland Federation of Art. That was a uh, exhibition at the um, uh, Solomon Islands Marine Museum down in Southern Maryland on the Patuxent River. And oh. uh, it was curated by Jack Rasmussen, the director of the um, AU, AU uh, Katzen. Katzen. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. The theme was flora and fauna for that show. Okay, well, I know you photograph flora and fauna. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, great. This has been a, a really interesting program and we look forward to having you back to show your work. And I hope everyone can come back and join us when we feature Rosemary's photography in the fall. We don't have a date set yet, but we'll be getting that. So thank you again, Rosemary. It was thank terrific. You.
Thanks for having me and thank, uh, thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye.